Welcome to Behind the Book. It's time now for Behind the Book. Hosted by Tess Thompson and Karen McQuestion. Two authors with a passion for books, no filters, and limitless curiosity. Join them now to find out the real story behind your favorite books and authors. And now, Behind the Book. Welcome to Behind the Book, our bookish podcast with my co-host, Karen McQuestion. This is Tess. (laughs) We're here in Seattle, Washington today. Well, two of us out of the three on the podcast today were in Seattle because we had Jane Ann Krentz as our guest, and she lives just across the water from me. So that was exciting. And then there's just me, the outlier who lives in Wisconsin. I do just... uh... Wish that I lived closer so I could hang out with you guys. That's okay. I know. Because I'll get to see you next week. Yes, at Nink. We're so excited. It's our favorite, or my favorite con- conference. I shouldn't say, I shouldn't speak for you, but uh, they have it every year at the beach in St. Pete, Florida. And it's this treat to be in the sunshine for me anyway, and, you know, that beautiful water. Funny thing, last year when we were there, um, the Moonlight Child had been doing really well, and Greg said, was anyone kind of impressed that your book was doing well? And I said, Greg, everybody there is doing well because they've got the requirement to belong to this organization. You have to have sold a certain number of books. So these are all very accomplished people that have, you know, they have movie rights sold and they've got their foreign language rights have sold in like 24 territories. And you like, nobody is the big stand out there, which, which is great, I think. Because everyone has a different background and it's fun to talk shop with people that are in the same place we are. Yeah, absolutely. And there's always something new to learn or relearn. And it looks like the um, conference workshop schedule looks amazing this year. I'm super excited for, you know me, I love to geek out in the in the workshops. I'm a perpetual student. So I'm excited for that part. But also just seeing all our buddies and being around people who really get us, <laughs> I guess you could say. <laughs> What I like about the workshops is that they have a blend of business and craft kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And then you sort of mix and match what interests you. So Mm -hmm. that's always fascinating. And then it's funny because I was letting Craig know, he's our uh, producer who does the editing, that you and I were going to be gone so that if he could do edit two in a row, we could get them scheduled before we leave. And he said, are you and Tess going on vacation together? (laughs) (laughs) Because he was like, I did not approve of this. And and I said, no, I said, we're going to this conference. So I will see Tess somewhat. I said, but actually, I said, she's going to be hanging with her romance buddies. And I said, it's like Norm in Cheers. She walks into the room and everyone goes, Tess. And then they... (laughs) They all gather around and lift her on their shoulders. And meanwhile, I just slink in and sit down unnoticed and alone. (laughs) Oh, my God. That is so not true. Although I should have taken a nickel from you every time I told people that you had um, one of the three best-selling books on Amazon last year. I just wanted to make sure everybody knew that. (laughs) I know. I was like... I was, I was really like secretly pleased, but also embarrassed. Like, <laughs> yeah, okay, Tess, yeah. that's enough. But, it was I know, very nice. but I couldn't help myself. It's like, I just want to, wanted people to know. And, and most of them already did, but you know what I mean? <laughs> See that drab looking woman over there that's trying not to attract attention. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, she chose me as a friend. So those days are over. <laughs> I thought you chose me as a friend. <laughs> How did that oh, work? Okay. Well, actually, that, that's probably true. <laughs> anyway. Okay. We'll say it was mutual. But uh, yeah, I'm sure we'll have lots of fun stories to share when we get back. But for now, we have, this is one of our fa- my favorite interviews so far. She was absolutely amazing. And I was saying to you before we recorded that she's one of my like heroes. I've read her forever. She's just so, so good and um, just writes the kind of books I love. And so I was afraid that she was going to be, I don't know either cranky or dismissive or something. And she was so kind and thoughtful and interesting. And so it was really good. She was perfect guest. Yes. All right. Enjoy the show. Today, Tess and I are so excited to have Jane Ann Krentz with us. She was on our wish list and we're so grateful that she accepted our invitation. 
Jane is the author of over 50 New York Times bestsellers. As Jane Ann Krentz, she writes romantic suspense in three different worlds, contemporary in her name, Jane Ann Krentz, historical as Amanda Quick, and futuristic as Jane Castle. There are over 35 million copies of her books in print. Welcome, Jane Ann. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. Do you prefer Jane Ann or just Jane? Jane. I, I, out West, it's just one name works fine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm from Seattle, so uh, Jane works great. Yeah, I am too. And I didn't actually know that until I was looking into more, um, you know, just for to prepare for the podcast. And I thought, oh, there's so many authors in Seattle. It's sort of crazy. It is amazing. It's like you turn over a rock and there's an author under it around here. I don't know what happened. Something in the water, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. Turn over a damp rock and there there we are. <laughs> Yeah, underneath the, uh, the the green stuff. <laughs> <laughs> the moss, exactly. Yeah. So tell us about your path to publication. Have you always wanted to be a novelist? No, no, I was not one of those early childhood prodigies that knew where they wanted to go early on. I, I was still trying to desperately find a career path by my senior year in college. You know, it was like, just where am I going to go? And I really did not get into the whole writing thing until I was out of college and reading a lot more fiction again. You know how you how that works. And once I started reading fiction again, I discovered the romance genre, which really hadn't been much of a thing in my world. I didn't know much about it. I mean, it was, I'm sure it was out there, but I wasn't aware of it. Very small town girl, very small town school. I just didn't see this stuff. But I discovered the romance genre and I just loved it. And I particularly loved the suspense angle, if it was in there, the romantic suspense angle. I found a book totally by happenstance written by Anne McCaffrey a long time ago before she went to Dragons, before she became a star in the, over in the science fiction world. And it was called Restory. And it was the first thing I had ever read in which we have the heroine kidnapped by aliens, taken to another planet, wakes up and is now in the middle of an adventure, a life and death experience with a very nice guy from the other planet. And it was classic romantic suspense, but with a science fiction background. And I just, that was it. That's what I wanted to write. First book I ever wrote was that, and it didn't sell because nobody was reading romantic suspense with a futuristic twist in those days. And I don't think it worked for Anne McCaffrey either because then she went on to dragons. There's a thing in this business that anybody out there, aspiring authors everywhere, I can assure you, it does not pay to be ahead of the curve. It's, it's, it sounds good, but you want to catch the wave. You don't want to be a decade ahead of it. And that's what I had done is what happened. So then I kind of doubled back and concentrated on the suspense angle because I'd always loved Nancy Drew, for crying out loud. And that worked for me. Romantic suspense, contemporary settings worked for me. But then at some point, I decided I just had to write those futuristics again. So I wrote three of them in a row. I think it was Sweet Starfire, um, Crystal Flame, Shields Lady, as I recall. I can still remember the titles because those three books killed my career. Oh, once, oh, again, I, once again, I was in the wrong time zone for that, for the, that kind of story. At that point, I had my three books that did get published that killed the career – by then, I was carrying so much baggage in terms of sales, poor sales, that nobody wanted, no publisher would touch me. And in those days, there was no option to go online, remember. This was, it was a traditional publishing or nothing. That's what, those were the only options. So nobody in New York wanted to handle the Jane Ann Krentz name because I'd killed it off. That's when I invented Amanda Quick and started writing historicals. That career took off. And then as things do in New York, when they realized when the, my old publisher realized that Amanda Quick was Jane Ann Krentz. They said, well, if that publisher can make her work, I guess we can too. <laughs> Took me back. <laughs> this is, this is course, my yeah. career. I'm sorry, but there's, it just goes up. It's like a roller coaster, the whole thing. And then at some point, I decided I wanted to try the futuristics yet again. And that's when I decided to go back to one of the earliest names I had ever used, which was Jane Castle, which actually happens to be my real name. Mm. And that name I used to start up the futuristics, figuring that if I killed off that career again, at least I hadn't destroyed the contemporary career and the historical career. That's the story of my life. 
That's where I am. <laughs> I have to ask, like, just because we do have a lot of authors that listen, and there are so many ups and downs to this career. How did you handle that? Like, is do you have any advice for us when we're like, we think this is going to be the best book ever and it totally tanks? Like, how do you pick yourself back up? The trick I learned the hard way is, it, first of all, I'll just tell everybody, you're going to have to keep reinventing yourself your whole career. That's just how it works. I don't know. If you're going to have a long-term career, you're going to have to learn the art of reinvention. And I think the key to the reinvention is to know what your core story is. So this is how I discovered my core story. The last futuristic I wrote, first time around, Shields, Lady, Sweet Starfire, one of the... I can't remember. I blocked it from my memory. Which one? I, which one? <laughs> which one was the final death blow? Um, I was forced to look at it at that point and say, "What am I really trying to write here? What is it? It isn't the futuristic settings. I'm not really that big on futuristic world building. I like it, but it's not my forte particularly. I want to write about the emotions involved. That's all I want to write. And I realized that when I looked back. When I looked at the core story in those futuristics, what I was really writing about was a version of a marriage of convenience. Two people who have no reason to trust each other, maybe have reasons not to trust each other, are forced together in a dangerous situation. And in order to survive, they will have to learn to trust each other. So trust, I realized the issues around trust, which is the biggest risk we all take, and we take it every single day. And the trust and a sense of reinventing yourself, which was all my characters are at that crux in their lives where they're having to change. They're having to reinvent themselves or having to get traction again for something's just blown up in their face. And now they got to start over. Those two elements are in everything I've ever written. And the beauty of knowing your core story and being able to define it literally in two or three words is that once you realize that it frees you because you can take it anywhere. You don't have to write it in a vampire setting. You don't have to do witches. You don't, if witches aren't selling this year, you can take those core emotions and move them to something else. You know, if you can write intuitively your whole life, if you, if you get lucky, (laughs) my experience is you're not going to get lucky forever in this business. So for what it's worth, know your core story and realize that you're writing emotions, not settings. Your core story is not your core plot. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. Readers are looking for an experience, not a bunch of things that are happening. They want to know what emotional experience they'll get from a book. You read for the drama. You read for the emotion. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, this is something we often ask, but for you, it just seems like a strange question. But if somebody wasn't familiar with you, which is impossible, um, what book would or series or uh, pen name would you suggest they start with? Well, I mean, start with the most recent one, because that's what I'm writing now. And we do change over time. So I would recommend starting with the book I'm writing now. And the contemporary that I've got out now that would make the most sense to start with would be The Vanishing, Jane Ann Krenz. And it's the, it's the first book in this Fog Lake trilogy. I, I tend to write in trilogies now. So The Vanishing would be a good intro to the kind of psychic romantic suspense that I'm doing now. And for the Jane Castle world, I'd say start with the current one, which is Sweetwater and the Witch. Um, That's the one that's out next week, the 20th. (laughs) Yeah. Um, And that's my Jane Castle futuristic world. That's the world I tried to reinvent several times. And it's finally, finally kicking in. And my Amanda Quick world I have kept for historicals. And currently in the historicals, I'm having a lot of fun in the 1930s, uh, California glam romantic suspense. And the most recent one in that is When She Dreams. All of my romantic suspense, I've always played around with the psychic vibe. I have never actually done the supernatural vibe, which is a separate category of books. That's that's like vampires and witches and magic. Um, but I do like the psychic thing. And right now I'm busily doing that in all three worlds. So, Well, the problem is I do have three pen names at the moment, which is another career path I do not recommend. <laughs> And, and, and for a very simple reason, it's very hard in the modern world to build three brands. And that's what you do if you, if you insist on using a pen name and are trying to write under two or three names, you are diluting your brand. And I do not think that is a good way to go. I'm stuck with it now, so I can't do anything about it. But I don't recommend it for newcomers or people who are thinking of changing. I'd say keep whatever audience you have, even if it's not all going to follow you. 
I'm wondering, have you ever had any pushback from your editor or agent about changing genres? Do they try to direct you to the most profitable one? No. You know what happens with genres is that editors will always tell you, and agents will always tell you, they don't see it coming first. The people who see it mm. coming first are the writers. My editors told me all for years, she said, I don't know what's happening. I didn't know the vampires were coming until the manuscripts start coming in over my desk. I mean, I could certainly see a situation in which an author who had multiple talents, you know, or could write in various genres would look around and try to find the one that fit best and, and do that with a conversation with an editor and an agent. Um, but I've never been directed to it, if that kind of thing. It's just, it's worse than that. What they usually say is, sorry, we don't want your book. That's not selling. <laughs> <laughs> no <laughs> it's not like why don't you try to write something else honey it's like no we're not buying that book bye <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'd love to hear about your writing process uh what does a writing day look like for you and do you outline i wish um i try I, i'm not a perfect pantser in that i totally don't know where i'm going but i have only vague ideas when i sit down to write i have a usually more of a plot point that I'm curious about. And I try to, I try to get some major scenes in my head before I start. Sometimes I'll start a book and all I really know is the ending and I just need to find a way to get there. Um, sometimes all I have is the beginning. I usually have nothing in the middle. That's <laughs> <laughs> but here's, here's the thing with me. And I think for a lot of writers, and it's something to pay attention to if you are writing, which is that, I and most of the people I know get their best ideas after they actually start creating, after they start writing. And I think the process of actively creating on the page puts the mind into a different place other than the place it is when it's outlining at the beginning of a book. I think that's, I think there's two different mindsets going on there. And for me, the creativity won't really kick in. I'll get my best ideas when I'm actually writing the book. That's all I can tell you. And sometimes, I mean, it's a sloppy way to go about it because very often I have to go back and redo whole sections, you know, or bring in characters I never planned to bring in, that kind of thing. So it's messy, but it's the way I, everybody does it differently. And that's the way I'm kind of stuck with doing it. But it's important to acknowledge that literally everybody does it differently. And if you're getting words on the page, it's working. That's so interesting. All right. Well, we, I have a I have a big question for you that requires me reading without stumbling, which we'll see how that goes. But your new Jane Castle novel is titled Sweetwater and the Witch, which you mentioned earlier. And this is what Booklist had to say about it. In the latest stellar addition to her Harmony series, Castle once again brilliantly draws on her own bewitching brand of literary magic to concoct a beguiling tale of futuristic romantic suspense that expertly fuses propulsive plotting, deftly, deftly now incised <laughs> oh, secondary <shut> up. characters. <laughs> this is awesome, yeah. Including a dust bunny and a pendant for... Pens. And of course, I forgot to wear my glasses today, so I may have said a few of those wrong, but that was that's pretty high praise. First of all, do you read reviews? And if you do, like, how do you deal with it? I read the good ones. If <laughs> um, I try to avoid the bad ones, I never look at one star and two star reviews on Amazon. I just don't go there. I mean, what's what's the point? It's the book is out. It's not good. Right, right. And you have to learn early on in this business that not everybody's going to like everything you write. That's just how it works. Even if they've been reading you for a long time, they may not like that book. Books hit people in a different way every time. Everybody brings something different to a book and everybody takes something different away. And I don't want to encourage anybody to think that they should try to change to meet the demands of reviewers. It just won't work. You're going to have to find your own lane. I mean, those early reviewers hated all my books. So now they love them. I mean, what changed? Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. They died off or off. <laughs> I don't know. They're gone. <laughs> they, they came to their senses. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe. Now, reviews, that also kind of leads into the whole thing about critique groups. That's something to think hard about when you join a critique group. You want to be sure you're in the right group, I guess is what I would say. My one or two experiences with critique groups is that there was a tendency for everybody in the group, including me, <laughs> to rewrite the person's <laughs> story. <laughs> it's like, 
oh no, why don't you open it here? It would be so much more exciting because that's the way I would have done it, which is stupid. I mean, that's, that's useless information. If you can say something about it's a slow opening, as a reader, I'm responding as a reader, I, and it's a slow opening, that's something you pay attention to. There's other places to start a story. But for just to jump in and say, why don't you open it when the blah, blah, blah happens? It's like, that's not helpful. The other thing about a critique group that I saw in practice is that there's a, this was a large group, mind you. So it's not like three, two or three people you really trust, but kind of a generic large group. And there was a tendency to homogenize the story, to smooth it out, to smooth out all the high over the top stuff and to smooth out the darker stuff. It was like, I guess it's that put a bunch of people in a room together, like a jury, you know, eventually they kind of come to a middle and that's not what you want when you're writing. So just be careful with critique groups and make sure you're in one that's inspiring you and not making you feel like everything you're doing is wrong. Is there someone you trust with early versions of your work or do you wait till you're all done? I wait till I'm done. Mm -hmm. I will call up a friend, uh, other writers or, or my editor who I've worked with for a long time now and discuss a plot point that I'm iffy about or not sure of, or how do I get there? You know, just that kind of chatter is, can be very helpful. Usually not because either one of you comes up with the right idea at the time, but because it starts you on another path and you do come up with the right idea. It gets you out of whatever um, alley that you're kind of trapped in and makes you go down another road. And that can be a very useful kind of conversation. But I don't think you could do that with a critique group because it's it has to be kind of a one-on-one experience to work that way for me. Now, you have another book coming up in January called Sleep No More. It has a fascinating premise. Can you tell us about it? This is my amnesia book, okay? <laughs> it's actually an amnesia trilogy. I've got three women stars, heroines, they're... We'll each one will get her own book. And these three women were strangers until they woke up together in a very strange situation, an abandoned lab, laboratory, and the fire, raging fire and an earthquake had just happened. And the three of them woke up and realized they could not remember the previous 24 hours. All three of them had lost 24 hours. And that's why I'm calling this the Lost Nights Trilogy. <laughs> And these three women have gone into the podcast business. Yes. <laughs> it could be you too, maybe. <laughs> I often forget things, so maybe yeah. I'd be perfect. Oh, there you're you halfway there, Tess. <laughs> there you go. It could be you. Um, and the podcast is looking for an explanation for what happened to them. But in the process, each book will cover a mystery or murder mystery that will be solved within the book with an overarching storyline of finding the answer to their own mystery. And all three of them, in addition to losing this night, develop some psychic talents. They've concluded they were experimented upon. Wow. Oh my God. That sounds amazing. <laughs> I cannot you. wait. <laughs> How did you think of that plot? That is just fasc fascinating to me. Uh, I think it's because of the psych. I've just always pursued the psychic thing one way or another. Mm -hmm. And as I have learned over the years researching psychic stuff, it's amazing how much, how many government agencies and name brand universities did serious research into <laughs> the woo woo thing. It's like, really? <laughs> There's no knowing how many millions of tax dollars went into this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not kidding. The CIA had a program. Duke University had a program. Princeton had a program. I mean, this is just, this is, <laughs> you're sort of jaw dropping. And then somewhere in the 70s, everybody got embarrassed. <laughs> Somebody realized this. We and, should probably uh, not be doing this. <laughs> yeah, this is probably not where we should be. This is not a good way to get money. But who knows if it would just went underground, right? So that leaves lots of room for plots. And basically, I, there's nothing you can think of in the psychic thing that they weren't running with. So it's like there's no new, no new news out there. Well, obviously, you um, are fascinated with paranormal or psychic elements. Have you ever had anything like that happen in your real life? Not really, but um, my mom was new age before new age was the thing, right? Okay, <laughs> long before it was a deal. And she had always had a kind of a, I would say an energy-based view of how the universe works. 
And it, for her, it always came to down to you put out good energy as much as you can because you're going to stir up whatever you put out. Put out negative energy, it's going to come back at you because that's just how energy works. So, so it has absolutely no scientific basis, <laughs> but I think it's nice. <laughs> it feels like a pleasant way to live, you know, put, put out good energy and where's the harm? You know, what can go wrong with good energy? But, you know, when you think about it, how many times do you say about somebody that they're negative, negative energy? I don't like being around them because everything is just a downer, you know, just a negative. Or you like being around somebody else because they're always fun. They're always, it's always positive. It's always upbeat. They're always kind. They're always outgoing. You know what I mean? It's like that. What is that? And look at music. Look at the power of music. I mean, it literally touches our emotions. It gets us, it can make us dance. It can make us sing. It can make us happy. It can make us sad. It's, what is that if not some kind of energy, however you want to define it? I mean, it comes to us in sound waves. Same with reading a book. The book has no physical generating of energy, but you're going to come away with some feeling after you've read it, positive or negative. So that's kind of what I lean on. And I think psychic romantic suspense works for a lot of readers because this my version of it is just like one step beyond intuition. And everybody sort of accepts the reality of intuition or we want to think it's real. So the psychic vibe is like just one step beyond. And that's how I get away with it, I think. I'm not asking mm -hmm. people to make such a huge leap uh, into a fantasy world. Now I'm going to uh, veer off course a little bit and ask you about the dust bunnies. <laughs> uh, and many of your readers adore the dust bunnies. And for those who aren't familiar with them, can you explain what they are and how they came to be? Dust bunnies. They have taken over my Jane Castle world. That's all I can tell you. And the proof of that is that, you know, I have to dedicate every book to them now. They have to have a starring role in every book there at the end. <laughs> I never get any credit for my my charming characters or my clever plots or my beautiful world building, all anybody cares about is the dust bunnies. It's like, I feel like I've become the, the cat mystery writer or something. <laughs> <laughs> Except with dust bunnies. And the answer is they're kind of, if you saw one, it would look a little like an Angora rabbit, one of those fluffy rabbits, little ears, except it's got four eyes. And when it goes into hunting mode, it has a lot of teeth. So it's also got a psychic vibe. And like that good dog you remember or that cat that knows you, um, the dust bunny hooks up with a human companion and they're faithful and they're your buddy for life kind of thing. So they're not a pet, but they're a companion and, they're, and they live for the moment. They're not worried about the future, not worried about the past. And they kind of, all of my characters kind of realize that the lesson you learn from dust bunnies is you fight when you have to fight, you eat when you want to eat, you have fun when you when the, the rest of the time. You know, it's like, it's like, <laughs> this is, life is for the enjoyment of it all. And that's what the dust bunnies kind of bring that vibe to the stories, even though the humans are going after bad guys and nearly getting killed. But <laughs> so did you anticipate that that would become a thing when you wrote no, the dust bunnies? No, no, no. <laughs> this is like putting a dog into a book and then all of a sudden you're writing canine mysteries for the rest of your career. <laughs> There's that old saying from the vaudeville days, you never want to go on after a kid or a dog. Well, let me tell you, this is this is a real thing. <laughs> you put an animal into a book and man, that animal just takes over. You obviously captured people's imaginations with that. I mean, it's so clever. Yeah. Well, I am. Um, the story itself, if we may talk about the, <laughs> the rest of the book. <laughs> oh, sure. <laughs> Oh, sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Write that off, Jay. We're not interested in the rest of the story. <laughs> but I, but this Sweetwater and the Witch is set on the planet Harmony, which is a colonial planet far off in the future, in which humans are living in a sort of a paranormal version of our 21st century. So that's the vibe. It's not like super futuristic or something, but things have taken a twist because the humans that colonize the planet have developed a psychic vibe and their energy is paranormal amber, not oil. And, you know, they everything is kind of oriented toward the psychic thing, and that's where the energy source comes from. But the basic plots are always basically murder mysteries and ongoing behind-the-scenes uh, bad guys who are determined to take over the, the colony. And that's those are the plot lines. And Sweetwater and the Witch is set in my version of, it's Las Vegas on Harmony, but way more weird, Okay. <laughs> 
<laughs> that explains that's the town they're in. I'm pulling on the crazy Las Vegas vibe, which I love, and then um, adding in the psychic thing and the alien ruins and whatever else I can think of and dust bunnies. Well, you obviously are very prolific. Do you have any tips for how you stay on track? I don't write more than one book at a time. I'm, I can't walk and chew gum at the same time. So, so once I get obsessed with a story, I'm just obsessed with that story. And that's what I focus on. And that's all I think about. I don't even think about the other three, the other two careers that I'm running until it's over and it's finished and it feels complete. At this point in my life, I'm working under contract. So in a sense, I guess the contracts dictate what I'll write next, but I won't be writing two, I won't be trying to do t- two different stories at the same time. I'll be writing one book and obsessing over it because that's kind of how I go at, go at it. I came out of the corporate world. So I, so I have a certain discipline in terms of just the hours of the day that I spend. And, you know, I, my mornings are my strong point. So I'm, most of my serious work will get done in the mornings. In the afternoons, it'll be maybe research or editing or shopping, <laughs> <laughs> cooking, something. Because you can wear yourself out. I mean, it's exhausting. Serious writing day after day is exhausting. And you do have to pace yourself, I think. So do you keep a list of story ideas as they come to you? No, because I'm not getting them. I'm, I'm only getting ideas that are in that in the book I'm writing now, I, oh. my mind, my mind is not going off in another direction. If the closest I would come to a story idea might be a, a plot idea from the newspaper, you know, something that would come up that I'd say, Oh, that sounds like I could put a psychic twist on that story. In that sense, I guess I would keep, but it's just a side thing. It's not a, I don't really focus on it that hard till I'm ready for it. Uh, how about uh, writing craft books? Are you? Is there anything that you've really enjoyed, or that you always go back to, or that you would recommend? I don't. I've never read one. I think they're a fine idea, and I know people just love. They discover a book and it speaks to them. Whatever gives you inspiration, whatever kind of gives you that, it, whatever you need, go read it. If it works, I just kind of have fumbled through my whole career. <laughs> it's probably a good way to avoid making some of the mistakes I made. It's probably- <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah, but I also think it can be limiting and a little overwhelming because I am a craft book junkie and I think it can be paralyzing because, you know, you're you're reading about all these great examples of how something's done and you think, well, oh, I don't think I could do that at all. What am I doing? I should go get a day job. Yeah, I, I think maybe that's why I've kind of unconsciously not gone down that path because I expected to speak to a higher literary power than I've been. <laughs> I'm not going to go there. I'll just, yeah. As you say, I, I think I'm finding it depressing. <laughs> I, I, in the sense that I don't, I can't do that. Now, we always talk about marketing tips and you have an established readership and a, I'm sure your publisher takes care of the majority of the, the marketing, but is there a favorite way you like to connect with readers? Well, I got into Facebook early on when that was the hot one and I built an audience there. So that has tended to be my strongest audience but they tell me that's not really where the action is these days. So if you're out there, I mean, most people are way ahead of me on this. I do have a TikTok account, which I've hardly ever used because I don't have the energy for TikTok. And I've got an Instagram account, but it's I don't really use it the way you're supposed to, you know, as a way of communicating. I think Facebook for me is the, is what I'm stuck with. But uh, like I said, it's it's all online these days. And that doesn't matter if you're self-publishing or small press publishing or New York press publishing. I mean, New York is doing the, uh, the social thing just like you are. It's just, that's all anybody's got. One of the things that really, really hurt us early on, and this is goes back a couple of decades now, if you're old enough, you will remember that there was a time when every mall in America had a Walden Books at one end and a B. Dalton's at the other end. You could not walk down that mall without seeing the new books that were out on display in front of those two shops, even if you were only casually interested. But you walk by and, oh, hey, there's the new Tom Clancy. There's the new Daniel Steele. You wouldn't have even known about it otherwise. But because of those mall stores, you knew about them. When those closed, nothing ever took their place. And that's been especially true for genre. And then shortly after that, Amazon opened up. But it's a different way to shop. You're not going to run into the books the way you used to when you could physically pick it up and flip it over and read the back or 
you know, it just is a whole different shopping experience. And it's not curated in the way that the bookstores curated it. So it's just a different experience out there now. And I think the fact that the stores just aren't there, you know, we just look how many Barnes and Nobles have closed in this past two years. I don't think they're going to be open. You know, a lot of those stores, I don't think we're going to see them again. Remember when borders went down? What that has helped and given rise to our independence, and that's great, but independents in order to survive usually tend to specialize. You know, being a general bookstore is almost impossible. You just can't be a bookstore for everyone. There's too many books. <laughs> you can't carry that kind of stock anymore. I just don't know where it's all going to go into. I, you know, um, I'm glad to see more independence. I'm glad to see that's kind of coming back. And that's helpful. But the whole experience that we of losing those more generic bookstores is something we can't replace. So you were a contributor to a nonfiction essay collection titled Dangerous Men and Adventurous Women, Romance Writers on the Appeal of the Romance. Why do you think romance fiction is the most popular genre? Well, for one thing, more women read fiction than men. So, so right off the bat, we've got a, an edge there. But the, but the reason is because it's always been focused on relationships, not on plot, but on relationships. And it's always been fundamentally focused on that core relationship, which in one way or another is the foundation of a family. It might be a family of choice. It might be a family, you know, there's, it doesn't define the family, but it is a family. And you know it by the end of the book, when you see it, it's, um, it represents a commitment between individuals. And that core story is the foundation story for every other kind of story. I mean, there is no point in having a great science fiction novel if you don't have a reason for going through all the adventure. And that reason has to be humanity. It has to be community. The relationships in the stories are the building blocks of a community and that's civilization. So one way or another, it all comes back to romance. Now, Jane, I'm wondering um, when you were growing up, who were your favorite authors or, or favorite books? Nancy Drew. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody loves Nancy Drew. <laughs> yeah, it, it is kind of the perfect kid story as far as I was concerned. That's the one where I you know, it was never in the school library and it was never for sale in the stores. But um, in fifth grade, I remember taking my little dollar that I got for my weekly allowance or whatever it was and, and meeting my um, meeting my dealer out behind the restroom <laughs> of the school. <laughs> she got into the city every so often and carved up actual Nancy Drew books, brought them back and then sold them out behind the restroom. <laughs> That was, was that, that, that was a good business model. <laughs> that that was kind of where I got my early childhood education. Um, and then later, uh, Andre Norton. Do you remember? Did you ever run into Andre Norton? Mm -mm. She's long gone now, but she. I was fascinated with her. But there was something in those books that you, it had a romantic vibe. It was very underplayed. It was, but it, there wasn't a lot of options out there in the bookmobile, right? I remember asking way back when, "Is this a woman?" You know, what is Andre? Is Andre a feminine name or a masculine name? And, and, and years later, I found that it was a woman who would use that name as a kind of a, a way of writing science fiction, but which did not tolerate women writers at all in those days. So Andre Norton. Um, and then later, later Anne McCaffrey. But that by then I was out of school, out of college, I think. So I guess if you go back to childhood, it's, it was Nancy Drew and those horse books. And that's probably where the dust bunnies came from. In those horse books, there was always a bond between the horse and the little kid. Mm -hmm. and, and, and kind of a psychic uh, connection between them, for sure. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, what do you feel is the most gratifying part of being an author? I don't even know how to explain it. It's just the satisfaction of getting it out of my head and onto paper or onto a screen. Um, it, the process is actually probably the most gratifying part, even though it's the most frustrating and the hardest. It's when I get the scene right, it's there's no feeling like it. It's just a, it's a rush. I can't explain it. Even if it never sells, it's just a rush getting it out and seeing it defined on the page somehow. That's very satisfying. And I think if you're going to survive in this business long enough for any length of time, you do need to learn to take the small rushes <laughs> as satisfaction um, because there's too many negative things that can happen at the end, uh, including never selling the book. So if you're going to if you're going to keep your head above water emotionally, I think you need to take satisfaction in the process. I don't think you'd be a writer if you didn't. Is what it comes down to. It's too hard. Mm -hmm. 
It's too hard. Yeah. Well, you mentioned getting a scene just right. It's almost an instinctive, intuitive thing. Someone else could read it and think it reads fine, but you're like, no, it's not quite there yet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's that Mm -hmm. feeling and you know it when you see it. It's Mm -hmm. So does your family read your books? My brother does. He's a, because he's an audio buff and he likes, he he listens to audios a lot. So the rest of my, my mom did, but she's long gone, sadly. So um, she was the only one that was actually a dedicated reader. (laughs) The rest of my family's all male and they don't read a lot of romance. (laughs) They're very supportive though. I have never lacked for support. It's just a great cheer, cheering team, but um, no, they don't read the books. We understand you love to cook. What are your favorite dishes? <laughs> I love to cook, but but I don't do fancy cooking. I, I, I should take that out. Where did you find that anyway? It's <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's a Wikipedia lie. <laughs> it's not true. You don't love to cook. <laughs> I, do, I do love it, but it's not useful cooking for most people because uh, my husband and I follow a fairly strict low carb meat free diet. So mm. I kind of had to learn to cook stuff that we could eat. <laughs> it was interesting, but I don't have, I don't do baking. I don't do fancy uh, gourmet stuff at all. I just, um, I'd be perfectly happy with um, anything spicy curries, uh, spicy food, you know, where anything along those lines, but it's usually with tofu, not, not meat. So can you tell us what you're working on right now? Or do you usually keep it kind of secret? No, not in this case, because I'm working on the first book in another psychic trilogy, which will launch in January. And it's the first book is called Sleep No More. Oh, the one you talked about. Yes. Yeah. So I'm just kind of finishing up, tidying that up. Oh, we can't wait. That sounds fabulous. Oh, that sounds so good. So I'm curious, when you write your trilogies, do you write them back? You must write them back to back. No, because in between, I'm going to be writing the Sweetwater, you know, the... Jane Castle. Okay. Or, or, yeah. So. so you do weave in between. Um, yeah, that seems like it'd be difficult. Well, I, one of the things I'm careful to do when I start that, the first book in a trilogy locks you in. So you need to be careful about <laughs> how many rules you make for yourself in that first book. And I'm kind of careful to leave. I have an overarching idea of the backdrop, but I try not to pin the characters down. Although there's some core characters who will show up usually from book to book. I'm careful. I always work with a new couple, a new hero and heroine, because that way um, I don't have to break up the relationship that I put together in the last book. (laughs) Okay. Well, uh, that was amazing. And I could talk to you forever, but I know you have books to write. So we're just going to end the podcast with some fun extra questions uh, that are not writing related. What is one food that will never get past your lips? Snails. Yeah. uh, Escargot, right? Escargot. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> what superpower would you pick given the opportunity? Oh, wouldn't we all just want to make people kind? Wave a wand and make everybody think kind. Yeah, absolutely. What's your biggest guilty pleasure? <laughs> guilty pleasure. Do I have to feel guilty about it? Or <laughs> No, <laughs> you do not. <laughs> I like a glass of wine in the evenings, people. That's, I have to admit. Um, and I used to love potato chips, but that went out with the low-carb diet came in. So beyond that, I don't think of them as, if I'm enjoying it, I don't think I want to feel guilty about it. So, What's the worst job you've ever had? Oh, it was early on back in the corporate world. I was not cut out for a corporate world. If you could instantly become an expert in something, what would it be? Music. I'd love to be able to play a musical instrument well. Just never got there. <laughs> it probably wouldn't be any good if I did it. <laughs> What's your favorite smell? Oh, I love the scent of freshly ground coffee beans. Mm. Oh, that's a good one. That's a good one. Yeah, yeah that is a good one. Everybody loves that a bit. What's the most terrifying thing you've ever done? Uh, solo an airplane. <laughs> wow. Wow. That is crazy. I took flight I took flight lessons and there comes a point where you have to do it on your own. And that was the most terrifying experience of my life. And I soon decided I was not cut out to be a pilot. <laughs> That's like my short lived scuba diving career. Um, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, what's one thing you're really bad at? Math. If you could live your life over again, would you want to? No. 
I, you know, maybe if you knew everything you know now, but <laughs> and changed everything, but no, I never want to go back and live it again. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, if this has been amazing, thank you so much for being here. And I know our, our listeners are going to get such a kick out of this. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me and best wishes to everyone. Thank you so much. Yes. Oh, thanks. thanks. Take care. Thank you for listening to Behind the Book, brought to you by authors Tess Thompson and Karen McQuestion. They hope you found it entertaining and informative. If you loved it, tell your friends. And if you have a moment, they'd love for you to post a star rating or review. This has been Behind the Book.